Welcome. Come on in. It's our community, and I'm Mary Davidson, and our guest today is the Poet Laureate of Kansas for 2015 and to 2017, and his name is Eric McHenry. Welcome, and congratulations. Thank you. I mean, this is a real honor, I think. I feel honored. And I, I, and I, so you should. So you should. Thank you. But I need, as I, I, I think they would be interested, our neighbors out here would be interested in knowing that you are a fifth generation Topekan. I'm actually a seventh generation Topekan, and I'm a fifth generation graduate of Topeka High School. I think that the... Uh, Why did your family go there? Uh, I think the streets are paved with glue in Topeka. I think we can't we can't quite bring ourselves to leave. There's a, some sort of a deep familial attachment there. The Actually, the generations keep leaving, but then we come back. Well, the original ancestor, why did they come there in the first place? Oh, you know? yeah, that's a good question. I think probably for some of the same reasons that others were coming at that time. Well, actually, to so my seventh grade or sixth grade, oh, shoot, I'm going to mess it up. Robert Simmerwell, who is the the seventh generation uh -huh. back was uh, one of the missionaries at the Potawatomi Baptist missionary. Mission. Okay, yeah, well, see, yeah. that's why they came. Yes, that that was uh, yeah. that was one strain, but then then others came I shortly that, thereafter. That's, and nobody leaves. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> or rather, we leave and we keep coming back, as I now have done. Myself. Well, you went yeah. to Beloit College and you went to Boston University, where you got your master, but you came back home. I did. I came back. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever think about not coming back? Oh, I didn't ever think about coming back until the job opened up. Or rather, I thought, you know, longingly about coming back, but I didn't think there'd ever be the possibility that I could. Well, you're an uh, assistant professor, associate professor. Associate professor, associate professor, professor. Just I recently. mean, there is a big distinction that I do have to make here. <laughs> an associate professor of creative writing at That's right. Washburn. That's right, so, yeah. So, I, you know, I always have wanted to ask somebody this. When you say creative writing, what is that? I mean, to me, if you write something, you have created it. So what is creative writing? It may just be a useful term for distinguishing um, fiction, poetry, creative nonfiction, and, and hybrids of those genres from other sorts of writing, uh, like journalistic writing or technical writing or something like that. But I agree that any act of writing is, is creative, creative. And I try yeah. to encourage my composition students to be as creative as I encourage my poets to be. Now, you have not always been a poet. That's true. And yeah. what, and what do, I know you, you write criticism. I, I may still not be a poet. I'm, I'm working on <laughs> becoming trying. one every day. Uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. We, all get, we must keep trying. <laughs> yes, we must. Yeah, Gwendolyn Brooks, another uh, Topeka native, said that a poet is something you're constantly trying to become. It's, it's uh, not a destination you reach. It's really a journey. But I did write journalism right after college for quite a while. And I was writing poetry on the side. But, uh, but I haven't been a professor of poetry except for the past seven years. I well, guess. but you have written criticisms that have appeared in the New York Times and in Salon. Yeah, yeah. I've uh, had some really great opportunities as a freelance journalist to uh, pair my interest in critical writing with my interest in poetry and to write some poetry reviews, and that's been delightful. Have they been poetry reviews? Uh, for the most part, for yeah. Most I've written some reviews of nonfiction works and things Isn't like that. Isn't Salon uh, basically an online magazine? It is online, yeah. I've only written one piece for them, which was a, a longer essay about a really interesting guy who was obsessed with the juvenilia of Barack Obama, but I wrote several uh, appreciations of poets for Slate Magazine, too, and uh, which is also an yeah, online publication. Also, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, Salon and Slate are oft quoted. That's true. Yeah, and oft yeah. read. I'm not sure that I am oft quoted, but Salon and Slate are, so I'll happily <laughs> attach myself <laughs> to them and their fame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that's kind of interesting, and I think it's interesting because um, you write poetry books. Mm -hmm. And the one we're going to talk about is called Odd Evening. And oh, these are all my markers that I've marked poems <laughs> that I like. But this is Odd Evening. And do you write poetry that appears online? Uh, some poems do appear online when I first publish them. I've published some in Slate. Um, and sometimes when you publish a poem in a print literary journal, it will appear in that magazine's website as well. And so I've uh -huh. had some poems appear well, online. Well, I, I would encourage. Um, all good Kansans to stand up and be counted and buy a book. <laughs> I would too. Do your duty as a Kansan. Let me please. let me just ask you a question. Now, when you publish a book, you're paid to, for the, by the publisher and you're paid by the number of books that you sell. When you publish a poem online, how do you how do you get paid? 
It depends on where you're publishing Well, let's it. take Salon. Yeah, well, so I haven't published a poem in Salon, but when I published poems in Slate, uh -huh. <laughs> that's an interesting story. Slate, I think, no longer publishes poems, but they used to publish one poem per week. And mm -hmm. when I first published a poem there, uh, Slate was still owned by Microsoft and bankrolled by Microsoft, and so uh -huh. I received $400 for that poem. When I published uh, a poem later, they were owned by the Washington Post Corporation, and I think I was paid $250 for that. Yeah, and when I published another later, I was paid $100. The, the fee kept <laughs> diminishing, and finally poetry was eliminated altogether. But maybe you at least got a thank you. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I always got well, a thank you. Well, I, I have to also ask you, before we talk about your poem, when you get ready to write a poem, I mean, does something come to you, or do you have to decide every day that you are going to sit down and write something. I mean, how do you work? That's, that's an, what I'm asking. That's an excellent question. It's a combination of both, and I think it differs from, the experience differs from poem to poem, but uh -huh. I think that it, I don't think that I would get very much written at all if I didn't go to my desk and say, you need to dedicate some time to writing and do the writing, and even if I don't have an idea in my head, I'll find a way to give myself an assignment or give myself a prompt just to get some language on the page, and then a poem can sometimes emerge where I didn't expect it to from that sort of just daily discipline. See, I don't have that kind of discipline. I can think of 500 reasons why I cannot do that just right now. <laughs> I'm pretty good at that too, yeah. I mean, daily I, might be paying myself yeah, I a can't. compliment. But. So what, what gives you an inspiration? What, what, I mean, what do you, do you walk down the street? Do you take, a, I, I think in the bathtub, so I, I you know, People. We have we have uh, crayons in our bathtub, uh, you know, children's crayons that they uh -huh. can graffiti on the sides of the bathtub with. But they're there. They were a gift from my mother for me because I was losing ideas that I was having in the shower. I, in fact, at times in the past, have turned up the heat in the shower in order to get more condensation on the door so that I could write down a line of poetry <laughs> in the steam on the door so that I wouldn't lose it. So uh, mom got me these uh, Leave shower it to crayons. Mother so to that's get right. Thanks, take it. They, care they of. find the solution. So yeah. But that's often, uh, yeah, it's, it's when I'm walking, when I'm doing the dishes, mowing the lawn, th that a phrase or an image or a metaphor will occur to or me. Or maybe that something will seem, somebody says to you. Or maybe something somebody says to me. I'll, yeah, things caught from, from the speech of others will occur to me as having a really interesting um, combination of sounds or uh, meanings. And I'll try to get that recorded in a notebook somewhere or in my phone. And, and then later I'll, I'll look at my phone or my notebook and try to tease poems out of those little fragments that have come Now, I know that you teach poetry writing. How do you do that? I mean, I, you can teach a short story because it has certain elements. Mm -hmm. You can teach a novel because it has an ending, a middle and a denouement mm -hmm, and an mm -hmm. ending. But how do you teach somebody to write poetry? Because it isn't uh, line by line rhyming anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes it is, and it, it can be if folks want to. And there are sort of forms of poems that have um, structures that you can teach. You can teach, although it's difficult, meter, uh, and you can teach the Petrarchan and the Shakespearean sonnet and the villanelle and other forms from other uh, traditions if you want to. Uh, but I think the idea maybe that you're driving at is how do you teach what's fundamentally an act of inspiration, you know? And, well, and, an and of, how uh, do you condense it into, I mean, you can't write a whole book. Well, you can write a, uh, you know, a, a, a poem that tells a story, and it's a whole book. I, mm -hmm. I, um, but <laughs> you have to condense. How do you teach that sort of yeah. compression or efficiency? Yeah. yeah, giving very focused assignments really helps. I'll say, uh, I want you all to try to write a poem about a parent or a parental figure, and I'll show them those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden and My Papa's Waltz by. Theodore Retke and Supernatural Love by Gertrude Schnackenberg and other examples of really tight, short, effective poems uh, about parents or parental figures uh, that give them um, ideas and inspiration, hopefully, and then just challenge them to tap their own experience and observations and see what they can do in 15, 20, 30 lines. Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, John Nyhart was my teacher. And John Nyhart wrote epic poems mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. about Indians. And probably the one you might be the most familiar with is uh, Black Elk Speaks. Mm -hmm. And right. it's, it's the story of the, and of the Song of the Indian Wars is mm -hmm. another one. I mean, if you haven't looked at an epic poem um, as opposed to a concise, um, I mean, there's so many kinds of poetry mm -hmm. that yes. I would urge 
and I'm sure you urge your students to, to familiarize themselves because something just might take root. Exactly. <laughs> and that's it, the, the breadth and the diversity of available poetry is one of the most important lessons in a poetry class because too many people, I think, encounter a poem that they dislike or that doesn't resonate with them and they conclude from that that poetry isn't for them which is something you would never do if you turn on the radio and heard a song you disliked. You wouldn't conclude that there was no music out there for you. You would just say, I dislike that song. But people will sort of shut poetry out if they've had one bad encounter with it. Poetry is so vast and so diverse. And as you say, there are epic poems and haiku, and there are formal poems and free verse poems, and poems deriving from every uh, imaginable cultural tradition and in every uh, level of diction. And uh, there is something out there for everybody. And that's been one of the big themes of my uh, being poet laureate, one of the speeches that I give is called A Poem for Everyone. The idea is that if you are patient enough with poetry to give poetry enough chances, you'll encounter a poem that can change your life. You may not have encountered it yet, but it's out there. Well, uh, some years ago, I represented the United States Department of Education here, and uh, they did me the honor of asking me to open the Japan Festival, and I would write a haiku to, along with my remarks, uh, sure. and it's, I mean, it's, it just kind of comes to you. I mean, I am not a poet. I do not wish you to think that I am infringing on your territory here. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but I, but, but I, all. Um, I just think that um, creative thoughts come to all of us if we let them enter. I agree, absolutely. And uh, helping students discover that they have permission to let those thoughts enter yeah. is one of the yeah. fun tasks of now, being a teacher. I, I also know that you have taken on the rather onerous um, responsibility of teaching poetry writing to students K through 12? Uh, off and on, yeah, not on a regular basis, but I've certainly visited And most schools. of the students that you teach are what we might call adults. That's we right. We would all, yeah. uh, always hope, <laughs> yes. <laughs> on, a, on any given day, they might very well yeah. be adults, yeah. But <laughs> how do you, do you notice, I mean, in their ability to write, um, their age has, enters into it. It does, But yeah. But how, how do they, how do you change your approach, or do you, or h how do they respond? That's another great question. I think in some respects, um, younger kids are easier to teach poetry because they haven't learned how to not be creative yet. You know, learning, mastering language, as we eventually do as we become adults, is, uh, among other things, all about committing idioms to memory and, and even cliches to memory and, you know, various forms of speech that we've heard before and memorized and can then repeat back to others in uh, the sorts of transactions that conversations are and we all know you know the signals and the clues and the exchanges and younger kids are um, much more sort of open and free associative when they're describing or explaining or communicating and uh, that creativity that you possess as a child is something that you want adult students of poetry to be able to reaccess somehow so giving them prompts and exercises that allow them to think uh, in unconventional or idiosyncratic ways, again, can be really liberating for them. Well, it is. And you know, years ago I taught school, believe it or not, and we would publish a book every year because mm -hmm. I like create, and everybody had something in that book. The first one I published, I thought, dear Lord, please give me the strength to wring something out of everybody. <laughs> but you know, I didn't have to do that. Yeah. Even the, the less capable, they would write something, and often it was not bad. Right, right. Not bad. And everybody had something in the book and we published that book and, and it it was um, it was a source of pride for every single student in that class because they had something in mm -hmm, the book. Mm -hmm. So that to me is also important to convey that there is something in everybody that's possible. We dwell in the realm of possibilities. Uh, I read uh, somebody else said I didn't. I wish I had. Uh, but um, we do. When I was in fourth grade, we, uh, my class did a book of poetry as well. We had a poetry unit and it culminated in an entire collection of poems being uh, compiled by the teacher. And I read that thing cover to cover again and again, reading the work of my classmates. And uh, I still have some of the poems from that fourth grade anthology there memorized. And it was delightful to see what was in there. I would like to read something that you wrote and ask you to comment. Sure. You said, this is, this is in the book, derivative graffiti crawls up the overpass like ivy. Abstract names on concrete stanchions. To the south, symbolic walls. No outlet signs along the levee. Idle river, idle tracks, bypass, bluff side, 
and the backs of Potwin's late Victorian mansions flushed like book spines on a shelf, drunk on your late Victorian porch. And then you go on. And <laughs> now, did you see that? Uh, to me, those are glimpses. Mm -hmm. I was trying in that poem, which is called Figurative North Topeka, I think, to justify, um, or to, I'm sorry, juxtapose um, what's happening in some parts of town with what's happening in others in Topeka, which is my hometown, uh, and thinking about the parts of the town that are thriving and the parts that are neglected. Um, and uh, there was something just compelling to me about that, about the idea that a town is a a living organism like maybe a bush or a tree and some sides of it may be flourishing and other sides may be in need of some loving tending and pruning and things like that and so I was uh, trying to describe uh, North Topeka in a way that felt uh, North Topeka is the, the side of town that throughout the 20th century was repeatedly devastated by floods and never really was able to fully recover and uh, I was trying to characterize it in a way that was um, vivid and made the reader feel like he or she was there, but also was true to that area. Well, and sometimes you have some habit of approaching a very mundane subject in a very um, classical way, if I may be bold enough to give you a compliment. Thank you. Uh, this is called The Last Payphone in Topeka, and I'm just pulling out a verse that I like. When I approach you on your corner or in your stuffy entryway, I'll do it mutely like a mourner, Respects are all I've come to pay. That as one they, was... As they say, there ain't none left. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't so many. Yeah. No. Topeka Magazine was going to publish a photo essay called The Last Payphone in Topeka and wanted a um, poem to accompany it. And so I got to thinking about the payphone and the way it's become sort of a, a thing of nature and, and uh, you know, seeing a payphone is increasingly rare. It's like seeing a bobcat or a coyote around town or something a, like that. A thing and of the museum. Yeah, so yeah, it's on its way to the museum, <laughs> exactly. It's this, it's this artifact, but I wanted to address it in a respectful way that acknowledged its, its former prominence and its near obsolescence yeah. and sort of memorialized it appropriately. And obsolescence is a very good word because we live in a world of obsolescence. Yes, we do. We do. Instant obsolescence. Yes. I'm always yes. gratified when some new technology that I haven't mastered has itself become obsolete and so I don't have to worry about it That's anymore. Right. You know, I'm so far behind the curve that <laughs> it yeah, doesn't make even any things difference. that are too new to me are too old for Believe the rest me, of the world. You're preaching to the converted. Good. <laughs> we can form a support group. And now I understand why you wrote this one because your seventh back relative was a missionary. Mm -hmm. This is called At the Baptist Mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say, in your translation, you relieved the Bible of its possessive case because you knew that ownership had no place in the tribal vernacular, although that isn't true, you said. It's true that they relieved you of your tents and maybe one possessive when you died, but they didn't like significant events estranging names for what they signified. According to the 1820 census, no one was here. A bison understands the need for new translations because sense is a property and properties change hands. According to one of the 17 surviving speakers, you were fair and good. She said your honorary name might mean prayed slowly or believed he understood. I uh, like that. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was, that's a strange poem, I think, and I'm not entirely sure where it came from, although you're absolutely right that it was my, my missionary forebear whom I was thinking about. He did translate part of the Bible into uh, Potawatomi, Potawatomi I was which is not a written language, it's a spoken language, and so it must have been sort of a phonetic translation, and I got curious about that language and looked it up on Wikipedia, and I don't remember how many living speakers of it there still are, but there, there certainly aren't many, and, um, you know, to be a, a white person who's lived in the state of Kansas, uh, or whose family has as long as mine has, you, you're aware that there are invariably going to be, you know, problematic or troubling encounters with uh, Native people in your own family's history, and I was trying to sort of mentally chew on that and think about its implications. Well, don't you think to some degree, um, you know, uh, on the World War I memorial it says it, and I think it's very um, apropos, lest we forget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think some of what you write has to do with lest we forget. Thank you. Yeah, there's an obsession, I think, in my writing, although I don't um, 
you know, pursue it as any kind of a project. It just keeps coming up again and again. I guess that maybe is what makes it an obsession, but uh, with uh, memory and memorializing and with the transience of things and uh, the desire that's in all of our hearts to hang on to what's most meaningful and to retrieve the past somehow or, or vindicate it or validate it. <laughs> this is one good shove. Deploy the tilt, umbrella. Sit down with your ice water, canned citronella candles in horsefly water, and watch Aurora huddle with Snow White, Cinderella, one newer, darker model, and your daughter. Sun through the hackberry dapples and the penicillin pinks of their overinflated raft. They've touched no spindles. Bitten no bad apple, she obviously thinks. They can ride out summer on that dubious craft. She's not the strongest swimmer, but look at how she handles resistance, how she frees a corner from the skimmer that wanted them aground, how she won't let breeze that just blew out your candles push them around. These are your children. That is, that's, that's my daughter on, on, her, uh, on her pink Cinderella, uh, or her pink Disney princess raft. Yeah. Yes, they're all big Disney princesses yes, at that's certain right. stages in their life. Yeah. But see, you have also, this is another I would accuse you of, making things rather immortal hmm. that are important to you. I mean, this is always going to be there. I'm grateful for all the things you're accusing me of. These are terrific. A classicist, uh, immortalizing things. These are yeah, everything see. that a poet aspires to. See? So thank you. And yeah. that's what you do. And I, I to me, um, it's important. Thank you. And, and I... Um, this, and having spoken about your daughter, we really spoke about your son oh, now. Sure, yeah. And we say, Street View. When I decide to let my son pursue me like a tiger swallowtail through Seattle, I begin in outer space, double click down to 16th Avenue, take the floating arrows north until I see his blurred out, fascinated face. He can't keep up with me for long. He's still a six year old and running up a hill. But there he is in that year's jacket, racing the awesome camera car, and there he'll be until it comes around again, effacing the rest of him for all the world to see. Although again, it's not the world he's chasing up this street at midnight, it's just me. For a long time, you can't anymore as the poem predicts, but for a long time if you looked at a particular stretch of city block in Seattle, you could see my six-year-old son spotting the Google camera car on Google Street View and chasing it up the street. If you clicked the arrow up the street and then sort of panned off to the side there. There he was, sort of right alongside the, the car following it. Um, and that was very touching to me, you know, that that moment in his life of seeing this strange car go by um, and at, a, at a time that he was obsessed with cameras anyway uh, was preserved, but it was only going to be preserved for a little while and then he was going to disappear back into his day and into his life and uh, But you didn't let him do that because when he's 50, 60, 70 and you may not be here, he will remember because the f verbal photograph that you took is in this book. Thank you, thank you. I think that's really the impulse behind writing the poem is to yeah. preserve it somehow, to hang on to it. Okay, now I gotta ask you a more mundane question about poetry. Sure. Every one of your poems has a title. How, how, at what point do you title things? First, last, in the middle? That's really, that's an interesting question too. Uh, it. Uh, it varies from poem to poem as well. Sometimes the title does precede the poem um, in as much as the title reflects sort of the assignment that I've given myself. The Last Payphone in Topeka is one of those. There's one in there called How to Steal the Laptop of Your Childhood Nemesis, which uh, was um, based on an assignment that I had given to my students about writing instructions on how to do something that you yourself had never done before and didn't really know how to do. Um, other times, the poem will come first and then I'll need to give it a title. And do you ever have to dither? I uh, dither a lot about titles. <laughs> titles are very important. They're they're in a bigger font than the rest of the poem. They're the first no, words that a person causes, sees. I was going to say it causes you to read it often. It does. Sometimes it yeah. can. It can be an invitation to read or a deterrent. And sometimes the title is necessary information. You can't understand what the poem is about without it. So, no. Yeah. Well, you call here. Here are some of the titles which are kind of interesting. Five Legged Spider, First Responder, Deathbed Confession. Oh, there's one. You're back. The Darker Grass, Turkeys and Strippers. Oh, that was good. Uh, copying the Master, Randy Used a Word, Pass Through, Stay. I mean, they're not long. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to short and sweet. 
Generally, yeah, to try to summarize or capture, maybe summarize is the wrong word, but to try to say something that contributes to a reader's appreciation of a poem uh, and that is somehow seems fundamental to the poem in relatively few words. Uh, sometimes a lot of words can be amusing in a poem's title, especially I think if it's a short poem. But <laughs> I think Billy yeah. Collins has a poem called after reading the poems of the Chinese masters, I pause to admire the length of their titles, or <laughs> something like that, but it's, it is itself this elaborate title. But, yeah, yeah. I, then you're tired by the time you get through. That's right, yeah, <laughs> the title is most of the poem. I, I pause to admire the length and clarity of their titles, that was, that was a part of it. You said that you believe in the everyday value of poetry. Can I you expand upon that slightly? I don't think that, for me, a day goes by when I don't say to myself a line or a stanza or, or an entire poem that I admire, you know, that I wish I had written. Um, Robert Frost said a poem can be a momentary stay against confusion. And there are so many times in my life where I'm grateful that I'm an appreciator of poetry because I have a poem that I can call to mind that clarifies an experience that I'm having or um, complicates fear, it fear. in an interesting way. A fear, yeah, that's right, or a hope or uh, regret or you know any of those human emotions that there's a kind of a sense of gratitude that you have for uh, the company that you feel you have around you when you call those poems to mind because you remind yourself that someone has experienced this before experienced it profoundly and put it into maybe better words than you yourself ever could have come up or with. Eric if not maybe you were the first and can inspire others to do likewise. That's always the hope. It'll keep me writing for a long time. Yeah, the hope that I can I'm trying achieve. to get you all pumped up. Yeah, there, that's so. right. I'm, I'm going to tear out of here and write a <laughs> crown of sonnets this afternoon. Let me ask you this. What do you plan on doing, and you've already been doing it, um, as Poet Laureate of Kansas? What do you see as your mission, responsibility, or whatever? Uh, I sometimes jokingly say that after a year in the role, I think that the main job of the Poet Laureate is to go around the state answering the question, what does the Poet Laureate do? That seems to be the, <laughs> the thing I do most of the time. But, but in more serious moments, I, uh, I argue that uh, poetry can benefit from having an ambassador, that I can be uh, someone who uh, goes to places that, uh, where the people aren't um, compelled to think about poetry all that often and gives them an opportunity to think about it and maybe introduces them to some poems that they might admire and might want to seek out more work by uh, the authors of those poet poems. Um, but yeah, I like the idea that I can be a sort of an, an agreeable uh, introducer of poetry to people who maybe whose lives are, are busy uh, enough that they might not have time to seek it out for themselves otherwise. And, and maybe they might start writing on their own, too. Quite possibly. Uh, that would be nice. That would be. It'd be wonderful. I, writing is a great way of reading attentively. Uh, when you attempt a poem, it heightens your appreciation for the work that goes into making a good poem, and then you're able to read other poems more sensitively, I think. When you say making a good poem, what is a good poem? Is it something oh, that inspires others? I mean, there is a lot of bad poetry out there. There is plenty. There is plenty. Yeah, I'm sure I'm responsible for some of it. Uh, yeah, that's a. It will differ from reader to reader, I suppose. Exactly, yeah. because good is a very subjective term. It's extremely subjective. And see, that's right. what makes it a fascinating field because there's something there for everyone. That's right. Yeah, the the subjectivity increases the diversity of the sort of poetry that's available to us. There's, um, you know, one, one reader's trash is another reader's treasure and so forth. And, and that's right. But isn't that what people who put their thoughts on paper in whatever form, that's the whole idea, mm -hmm. to appeal to someone out there, maybe change a life, maybe um, change a thought, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. change a direction. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's all about, I, th I think. When I was poetry editor of a, an alumni magazine when I was working in Boston, we published a poem, and I, I don't remember the name of the poem or specific lines from it, but the central metaphor was that writing a poem is like tying a note to a helium balloon and then releasing it. And you have no idea whose backyard it's going to land in or whether it's going to make a difference to the person who finally does find that note. All you can do is let it go and hope that it finds its, its reader eventually. But there's plenty of evidence out there that... Uh, the effort is worthwhile because a lot of lives have been changed by, by poems. Well, one of your um, um, commentators on your book said, to say that Eric McHenry is one of the best and most delightful, most alive poets of my generation 
isn't enough praise. His native sense of music in English, his tonal variation, his generosity of spirit are extraordinary. And so I am honored and pleased and very proud to say thank you, Eric McHenry, the Kansas Poet Laureate, uh, for coming and sharing your talent and your thinking with our neighbors. And isn't it a wonderful place to live? It's our community. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much.